Staying at home every day has been tough. But what's tougher is my mom's anger if I don't come down the stairs fast enough after she yells my name. So this got me thinking, how do biological processes affect hearing? How does hearing impact movement? How rusty am I at hitting bones? I sought to answer all of these questions in Biology at Home. Welcome back to Biology at Home with your host, Arthur Lee. Today, we're going to be exploring the nervous system, uh, reaction times, and auditory reflexes on the tennis court. First, let's take it back to Arthur Lee to tell us about the nervous system. Thanks for the introduction, Arthur. The nervous system is what makes you you. It accepts and processes external stimuli and controls all of your actions. Like the rest of your body, the nervous system is composed of cells. There are two types of cells on the nervous system, nerve cells and glial cells. Nerve cells are what serve the nervous system's purpose, while glial cells simply provide support. There are three basic neuron types, sensory neurons, motor neurons, and interneurons. Sensory neurons receive external input and pass it into falling neurons. Motor neurons connect to muscles and glands, causing them to contract. Interneurons contain all other neurons, and they form pathways connecting neurons together. Here is the basic structure of a neuron. These left branches here are called dendrites, and they receive incoming signals. The center, the long center is the axon, and it is wrapped inside of a protective myelin sheath. These right branches here are called axon terminals, and they send outgoing signals. But how do neurons work? Let's zoom into the axon. Here's an axon membrane. Outside, there's a high concentration of sodium. Inside, there's a high concentration of potassium and negatively charged proteins. This forms a resting membrane potential and an electrochemical gradient. This neuron is currently polarized. To reach the state of a potential for passing electrical current, if one part of the axon depolarizes, a protein called the sodium-potassium pump works to move the axons, the ions, to their desired places. How does a neuron depolarize? Certain proteins on the cell membrane called sodium or potassium gated channels allow respective ions to rush through to the other side when a requirement is met. This is due to the types of gated channels, most being bolted gated channels, opening when a change in voltage occurs in the part of the axon right next to it. Ligand gated channels will open when a certain light ligand is bound to it, and mechanical gated channels will open with mechanical force. These will all pass a current to nearby portions of the neuron, and when there are voltage gated channels, the current will pass to that portion and so on. However, sometimes the current isn't large enough to trigger the voltage gated channels. Only when it is big enough and reaches a value called the action potential does the signal continue to other parts of the axon. Look at that, our nervous system works non-stop. I didn't even realize that I dropped my keys until my brain received a signal from my ears that my keys were hitting the ground. And that's what we'll be focusing on today, the auditory aspect of the nervous system. So the ear is a very complex organ, with the outer ear acting as a satellite dish to bring sound waves into the inner ear, which acts as a chain reaction to bring sound waves to the actual sensory part of the ear, or the cochlea, specifically the hair cells lining the balance of the membrane that's inside of the cochlea. These hair cells are what actually allow sound waves to be processed as neural impulses inside of the brain. Now, you might be wondering, how does any of that work? How do sound waves become neural impulses inside of the brain, specifically processed in the temporal lobe? Well, I'm here to tell you that after 40 years in 2018, scientists from Harvard Medical School concluded that one protein is responsible for this signal transduction, and this protein is called TMC1. It was discovered in 2002, and its purpose is to act as a port for the hair cells, allowing ions such as potassium and calcium to pass through the hair cells. And this right here allows neurons connected to the hair cells to be depolarized and to send neural signals. So that's about it for biology. And now to the part you've all been waiting for, the experiment. Wow, what a wonderful explanation, Arthur Lee. But we can't forget about our guest today, Dominic Marziali. He'll be rallying with me and hitting the drop shots to me for the experiment. Say hi, Dominic. Hi. Okay, so let's go to a brief explanation of the experiment. Thanks, Arthur Lee. Today's experiment will be examining the difference an auditory stimulus makes on reaction time and reaction speed. Arthur and Dominic are going to be hitting balls back and forth on the tennis court, with some shots from Dominic being difficult drop shots, such as this one. However, in other cases, uh, Dominic will yell the word drop shot right before hitting the drop shot, giving Arthur an auditory stimulus, such as in this case right here. Drop shot. The independent variable will be the lack or presence of an auditory stimulus. Basically, Dominic yelling or not yelling the word drop shot before a shot. So what we're testing is, how much more successful will Arthur be with the auditory stimulus compared to without the auditory stimulus? Here we go.
Now we're at the most exciting part of the experiment, the theta. First, let's summarize the experiment. The goal is to test the impact an auditory stimulus made on reaction time, and in this case the time it took for me to reach the ball after the drop shot. The control group were the drop shots without an auditory stimulus, and the experimental group were the drop shots with an auditory stimulus. The important thing to note is that these drop shots, both with or without an auditory stimulus, were randomly scattered throughout rallies, and I never fully knew when they would occur. Also, I didn't measure 10 trials without the stimulus, then 10 trials with the stimulus. Throughout the rally, there were drop shots part of both groups here and there, so I never knew when there would be a stimulus. Let's take a look at the data. There are 10 measurements in seconds of the time it took for me to reach the ball in both groups. The control group without the stimulus had a higher average time it took for me to reach the ball, at 3.34 seconds. The experimental group had a lower average of 2.36 seconds. With the calculation of two standard errors of the mean, the true mean of the control group could have been as low as 3.045 seconds or as high as 3.635 seconds. The true mean of the experimental group could have been as low as 2.096 seconds or as high as 2.624 seconds. Thus, the means don't overlap and the data can be said to be statistically significant. However, more experimentation must be done to be sure of the connection of an auditory stimulus and reaction time to minimize the effects of confounding variables. Now, how does this connect to the nervous system? Sensory inputs of the auditory stimulus are taken in in various ways by the sensory neurons. The signal of the auditory stimulus is turned into a current in these sensory neurons, and since it surpasses the action potential, it will, action vol it will activate voltage-gated channels of the axon segments in the current neuron. The current reaches the end of the neuron, then jumps from the axon terminals, past the synaptic cleft, and onto the synapse of the next neuron. The next neuron would be an interneuron, which connects neurons and creates pathways for impulses. This is where the signal would be processed, in this case, in the temporal lobe of the brain. Then the brain would decide what to do, and, the motion, is, and motion is created when a current is sent down the interneurons of the spinal cord into the motor neurons of the peripheral nervous system. This will cause the sarcoplastic reticulum of muscle fibers to enact the contraction of the fiber. This allows movement. The auditory stimulus causes this chain of events, and this leads me to getting to the ball earlier because of the extra stimulus. Now how does this connect to proteins? All nerve cells are made of proteins, but in this case one specific protein makes a big difference in the scenario. The protein TMC1 is responsible for allowing sound waves to be translated into a nerve impulse. This is the only protein that does this, and without it, the data that we see would be very different. There wouldn't be a difference between having an auditory stimulus or not, because the stimulus wouldn't be able to be perceived or even sensed. Thanks for watching. That's it for this episode of Biology at Home. Am I sleeping too much? Can I live off just dried mangoes? Is TikTok driving me insane? Find out next time on the next episode of Biology at Home.